And we are live with Carolina Poets. Welcome to Poetry Goes Viral from Carolina Poets. This is a bi-monthly series hosted on the Carolina Poets Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. We are here the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. I'm your host, Andrew Clark, and I want to thank my co-curator, Kimberly Sims Gibbs, who helps host this series. For our series, we've been fortunate enough to have readers such as Jackie Shelton Green, Ray McManus, Tyree Day, Nicole Brown, Jacinta White, and many others. If you've missed our readings this past year, never fear. They're archived on the Carolina Poets Facebook page. For each reading, we feature three poets with connections to the Carolinas or one of our neighboring states which means we host some of the most talented writers from two of the writingest states. We feature established poets and emerging voices. Tonight, we're fortunate enough to have three powerful voices join us. We will hear from the poets Crystal Simone Smith, Worthy Branson Evans, and Kalisa Ray. Please ask any questions of our poets in the comments below the broadcast. We'll have a short question and answer session at the end, so you have a chance to, to ask these poets what uh, anything that's on your mind. So uh, I'm going to introduce now Crystal, Sim Crystal. Our first reader is going to be Crystal Simone Smith. Uh, she is the author of three poetry chat books, Routes Home from Finishing Line Press in 2013 and Running Music from Longleaf Press 2014, and the newly launched Down to Earth from Longleaf Press, which she'll tell you about. She's also the author of Wildflowers, Haiku, Senryu, and Haibun from 2016. I hope I got those right. Her work has appeared in numerous journals, including Kalalu, Nimrod, Barrow Street, Obsidian 2, Literature in the African Diaspora, African American Review, and Mobius, the Journal of Social Change. She's an alumni of the Kalalu Creative Writing Workshop and the Yale Summer Writers Conference. She holds an MFA from Queens University in Charlotte and lives in Durham, North Carolina with her husband and two sons, where she teaches English composition and creative writing. She is the managing editor for Backbone Press. With that, I'd like to bring to the stage, our virtual stage, Crystal Simone Smith. Hey, Crystal. Hi, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, Carolina Poets, for this wonderful program. Really happy to be reading with uh, Kalisa and Worthy today. So um, without further ado, we'll get started. I'm going to be reading from Down to Earth, which is my fourth publication. Um, it is my fourth chapbook, actually. And it is published by Longleaf Press, who also published my first, um, or actually my second chapbook, Running Music. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Down to Earth, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, or sort of introduce the poems as I, as I read them to you. Uh, Down to Earth is my exploration of faith, my relationship with faith over many, many years. Um, I've in the past called myself agnostic, um, but I, I don't think that's a sufficient definition because I'm actually quite a very spiritual person. Um, but in these poems, you will find that God, uh, comes in all forms. So he can come in the form of a bird. He can come as a ghost standing right in the room. Uh, he can also come as, as, as we know God to be. Um, so um, with that, I'll just, I'll go ahead and, and get started. First poem I'm gonna read is called Faith at Age Seven was first published in Kalalu. Their interlude softens the sermon. You see organ keys move by themselves. The church dims, stained glass illuminates. The red curtain behind the pulpit slides open. The swaying choir parts like a sea, reveals the preacher walking on water, his robed wings outstretched a command to stand. He holds a woman mighty in body, dips and lifts her out trembling, crying, Jesus is all over me. 
How terrifying the atmosphere, how real. Into palms you pray, in pews and pillowcases. Be it wish or panic, he never answers. Wait on him, they say. You do. And the day you decide to die, he arrives, stands beside you in the room to witness your father knock your mother off her feet. You shriek. He does not flinch. You don't even know if he disapproves. Okay, second poem I'm going to read. We're going to stay in that same vein. Um, it's called Liver and Onions. Late Sunday morning, I drive hungover through autumn mountains, riotous with color. On one exposed hill, a tall white cross with a sign that reads, the offer still stands. I take the countryside barbecue exit where Southern churchgoers crowd for swine their God called unclean and utterly forbade. On the menu, liver mush, of which I'm offered a sample for pretending I knew not what it was. A soft fried square, a salty, bitter nibble. That is first remembrance and then song. Some good things should be said about not having much. Before cashmere sweaters, electric cars, organic food stores, meals of beef liver, God commanded the Israelites to sacrificially remove along with the fat and kidneys, organs he created to hold and filter poisons from the body. But we had crowded into the unholy city, living on prayer and low wages. A few dollars bought large slices of red liver, yellow onion, a sack of white rice. The hand that fed us waving a pointed finger in sermon, teaching us liver had iron and copper. It was good for the blood. So the next poem I'm going to read is called Song of Self. Um, as a poet, you know, I, I think it's very important, at least for me, uh, to serve populations that the greater society has sort of abandoned. So I often go into juvenile homes and I go into prisons and jails and I volunteer and do poetry workshops because um, they need to write and they need to write their feelings and, and sort of be able to express themselves that way. It's very helpful for them to get through the time. It's also helpful for them to sort of not end up in that uh, situation again. So this is called A Song of Self. I've known only two true Christians. One visited jails to convince girls only God's kingdom, not freedom, was free. So I get Sundays done this way, vain as an atheist, smiling into the camera at the barbed wire gate. They take my jacket, backpack of supplies, keys, and phone. So I make no qualms that a door with bars is a cage for juvenile black males. Let out into the sunlit commons or left in sails, shut out by the exterior light switch, the guard switches off. With only a cup of water and a prison handbook, a poetry lesson is in order, a song of self. This is how we let what's in, out. to three, four, I think I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to read, the reason why this is, I'm sorry, this is in such disarray here. I am going to read um, two high books. I have been writing for several years now, maybe seven or eight years, haiku. I started uh, under the tutelage of Leonard D. Moore, who is a haiku poet, a very wonderful haiku poet. He's been 
he's a great practitioner of, of writing haiku. He's been doing it daily for many, many, many years. And uh, I began writing haiku the same way, uh, writing it almost every day when I first started writing it. And that's sort of how the practice takes place and you become better at it. Um, and in that process, I also started writing in other Japanese forms. Uh, haiku, a uh, haibun is also uh, a Japanese form. And basically with haibun, um, you take haiku, it's when you have haiku sometimes, obviously it's very limited and very concise, a lot of brevity. Um, and you wanna sort of expand the narrative or expand the story. So uh, the idea is you use auto, autobiographical, I'm sorry, I can't speak right now. Um, you use prose, basically, where you're telling a story. It's autobiographical, it's the word I was trying to get out, uh, prose, and you pair that with a haiku. And the, the idea behind it, what creates the, the art is that graceful pairing of the haiku and the prose poem. So I'm gonna read two haibuns, which are in Down to Earth. The first one is called Shelter. When I failed at everything in a single Friday, I turned to crime. I wandered up the cul-de-sac to the house that won't sell. I trespassed the gate to the backyard where a sawtooth oak had grown roots as though perched in a park. The failure of a builder. I maneuvered the rough path to the Andorodak chair they left. I sat under the shelter of leafy canopy, rods of sun forming the prison of a golden teepee around me. Undulating clouds, the crow's drawn out calls. The second haiboon I'm going to read is called Post-Surgery Strength. Several years ago, some of you may remember, um, I had to have a hip replacement. I'm a runner, that's a long story. I don't know if it was necessarily the running that created that, that uh, necessary surgery, but I had to have a hip replacement, which is kind of difficult when you're only in your 40s and uh, you have young children and you're trying to keep up with them. and. Uh, so it was it was very traumatic for me to even get my mind around uh, being able to going into surgery. I'd never had major surgery. I would had two childbirths, but not major surgery. So um, I'm going to read this high boom that's about that. And then I'm going to actually read a poem about the surgery. Post surgery strength. After I lay static two days, they came to resurrect me. I needed sunlight, they said. The edge of the bed was a magical feat. Lifted to a stand, gravity reminded me I had indeed died a small death. Doused in sweat, I pushed one dead foot in front of another. My weight so heavy, the room became light. They insisted I sit a while. No, I groaned. Let's make it to the window. Evening storm, the nurse measures my heart rate. Okay, and the second poem about that same surgery, there's actually probably 10 or 15 poems about the surgery, but uh, there's only two in Down to Earth. 5 a.m. surgery is to be half with God and half on earth, or is it a dream? For luck, I plucked from a bucket the last single rose of yellow petals that bled to red edges, as no rose should be left in the dark. And so not to forget, new mornings are dark. One yellow star pulsing against the black vastness when they summoned me to come as I was. When did I exchange the living will for old magazines? I only recall the soft tug of resistance, my body ossifying, stiffening with the instinct 
to keep its original parts. In pre-op, my eyes dimmed under fluorescent lights, the room slow and dark. To the surgeon's groggy voice, I fell unreachable, but for the short seconds of waking on the table. Get her arm in the scale, he persisted. I had become a rag doll, limp, with no sound, screaming, an internal no. What is next? Let's see. I should have ordered this better, but I'm sorry. I tried to. Uh, let's see. Where am I? Okay. Just a couple more I'm going to read before I turn it over. Okay, this one is called Woodland Junior Church. Many years ago, um, I grew up in the inner city and the inner city uh, has its moments, but difficult, it's busy, there's crime, there's all of that, but it also uh, services its community well, especially uh, children in poverty. So there's lots of programs, far more than I've experienced here in the South with my own children. Lots of programs, lots of free programs. And so the, the idea behind that is to keep the children busy, keep them occupied. Parents are working two jobs often and not able to be home. So um, I partook in a lot of those uh, programs. And this one was, was one of those programs. Woodland Junior Church for Bob. And Bob was the driver of the bus. No one ever spoke of need. Like God, it was a silent presence. The smear of potted meat to bread. The trace of mother's toilet that lingered when she left for work. What met it was random. A young white pastor with a blue church bus. For six summer weeks, he rounded the congregation of us up smart aleck girls in our armor of plastic glitter shoes and faded marvel t-shirts, pubescent boys with enough natural anger to strike him dead in the world if they chose. All of us singing on the road, forever let us hold our Bibles high, high, high. In the sanctuary of a high school auditorium, his fellow brothering flung batches of candy airborne for us to catch as tangible blessings. On longer communion days, the bonus of drumstick cones, our expired mothers waiting as they were on their white savior. His fading portrait hung over the silence of the kitchen table. I'm not keeping very good time here, but yeah, I have, okay, it's 7.18. So I have one more to read you. I'm going to read Down to Earth, the title poem. And um, I, people have asked me about the title of this book, and it, it's really quite simple. Um, one of my favorite Stevie Wonder albums is Down to Earth. Um, it came out, I think it's 1966. And uh, the first, I, I have to read this, but the first stanza to the title is, down to earth once again, I've been away too long. I've got lost, but then I came home where I belong. So the idea behind naming this book Down to Earth was sort of me trying to sort of ground myself. And anybody who's reading it, it's a universal text. You, you know, you, you could see that, you could feel that yourself. It's a grounding of oneself, really, and um, reckoning with you know, religion, reckoning with faith, reckoning with all these sort of things that um, help us with our mental health and, and help us get through the day. Um, so this is down to earth. Sunset ricochets off the apartment doors like flashes of explosions. In lavish sunglasses, you struggle to park while clutching the vital $20 bill you have come to bequeath your single mothering sister. Over poor cell reception, she redirects you. We are not at the apartment. We are at the laundromat. 
You drive across the terrain of broken lot to the far end of a deserted shopping center, testing the dexterity of your SUV. Inside the extreme heat of narrow aisles, stacked with industrial washers, dryers, and nailed down chairs. There's no one answering your rescue calls, so you quickly escape back down the highway. Only the cell phone rings when you're just beyond reach and the alarm of her voice chides. Don't you recall the roar of laundry? The Saturday mornings, our mother with a sack of quarters climbing down into the basement to wash what we owned in the concrete of broken lights and waste. How she savaged a brick to prop the door for a wedge of sun to chaperone her in the dense heat. How she hoarded from the other tenants the few rumbling machines, folding every warm floral stitch into one colossal load. The tied bedspread carried back so heavy in her arms she'd rested in intervals on parked cars. Come back, please. Come back down to earth. Thank you, guys. Crystal, thank you very much. We uh, really enjoyed that. I was kind of blown away by some of those poems. And that new collection, can you tell us the name of that again? So it is Down to Earth. And if you visit my website, I'm sure you'll share the website. Yep, um, the chat. You can order it there. Um, if you like Amazon, some people like to get their books the next day. You can also order it on Amazon. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Can you stick around for some questions at the end? Sure. Okay, great. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. So um, remember to ask any questions you have for our poets in the chat section uh, beneath this video. So uh, we'll have a little bit of a question and answer section at the end. And the poets would love to hear what's on your mind. Maybe you want to hear what's on their minds. So um, up next, we're going to have Worthy Evans. Worthy is a communication specialist, artist, and poet. He's the author of two books of poetry, Green Revolver from University of South Carolina Press 2010 and Cold War from Third Lung Press 2018. Evans uh, Worthy grew up in South Carolina and Northern Virginia and had an unremarkable stint as a combat engineer in Fort Hood, Texas, and wrote and edited sports at several newspapers before signing on the Medicare contractor 15 years ago. He doesn't go, get out anywhere near as often as he wants, but he finds joy with his wife, three nearly raised children, and an old dog and young cat. So with that, I'd like to bring to the stage Mr. Worthy Evans. Hey, Worthy. You're muted. I just noticed that. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. But thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm uh, really thankful for uh, reaching, getting the invite here. Um, I've seen it for a while and I've tuned in on a couple of occasions. And um, I am I always feel like I'm out of the loop because uh, at any one of the things that I do, I get so overwhelmed with either Medicare or the sports seasons. Uh, or just life in general around here. Um, but yes, my, my first book is, um, uh, can you see it? Green Revolver. Um, this was, this came out in 2010. It was the result. It was, it, it was an entirely organic work. Uh, and uh, it's kind of odd to say that, but I mean, um, I didn't pursue a book. I, I just, I, I'd started writing poems for the first time in 14 years of not. Um, and I got, some notebooks filled and I figured, well, I might as well start typing them. And once I typed a bunch of them, well, here's a poetry contest. Why don't I just make a manuscript? And so I folded them all in and, and, uh, and sure enough, this is what the manuscript was. Um, I guess subliminally there was a, there was a mission in my mind. Uh, uh, these, the poems in green revolver are, are quite, um, imaginative, voyeuristic, um, uh, uh, filled with persona. I was playing with a lot of, uh, uh, because I had such a cubicle life and, and sort of uh, scheduled oriented thing, I, I reached out and I, I went into other people's lives, I guess, or I, or I tried to. Um, uh, there, there's some fun poems in there. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read any from them today just because, uh, you know, my, my next book, uh, Cold War, 
this one was a lot more personal and a lot more planned. It's 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 a it's a memoir and poetry that uh, not to say I had a terribly exciting life, but uh, it was um, I, it had its moments, odd, oddball things. And I'm going to read from Cold War, and I'm going to read some uh, new poems, just especially that uh, those things that I've written over the last year. Uh, some of them, a lot of them, are still in utero, but they're the ones I I, I have some finished ones. Uh, or close to that I'd, I'd like to read. So I'm going to start with this, and now I've got to find out where I had planned to read. Let's see. Um, you know, these are uh, basically a, a little bit more uh, parts of memories in my life. Um, and in this one, is a, it's a, a collage of memories coming together. Uh, where it was a case of where I was reaching back and thinking of the some memories from many, many years ago. Uh, at the same time, um, my dad was uh, having a lot of challenges with his memory. Um, and I, I don't know, it, it combined to this. I call it the persistence of memory. Nobody else was riding the horses. So I looked around to see the other kids play on a swing set and I ran on the chipped wood to climb on the horses. As soon as I set my little zipper shorts on the plastic saddle, I felt whooshed off and dragged back to the place where the kids swarmed the swing set like locusts on a rail fence. What's the big idea, Grandma? I said. The lady explained sharply that those horses were for the older kids. I'm a damned 46-year-old man, I said. I ruined my credit trying to save a house. I'm tired from working two jobs. And if I want to ride a damn horse, I'll ride a damn horse. She looked down at me as if I had pulled my pants down and urinated on her leg. Later, my father picked me up from the preschool. I caught my foot on the carpet this morning and fell flat on my face, he said. I meant to tell you about that, but your mama was out all day doing the Salvation Army and worried so much I called the police. It's okay, Dad, I told him. This lady slapped me, but I peed on her, and now I don't have to go anymore. He smiled at that. When he got home, he poured another drink and told me about the hole he found in his boss man's head. I told him about the sound his wingtips made when he walked home across the kitchen floor on the evenings he came home. Oh yeah. Uh, this one I used to I used to be a Civil War reenactor, um, and yeah, I I heard a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I I also majored in Southern history and got a real education, uh, and and grew a, uh, wide beyond that. But uh, um, intrin intrinsically, doing the little Civil War reenacting thing was kind of fun. Uh, anyway, but uh, you get a lot of questions, um, and. I made a poem about the most frequent question, how do you know when to die? Uh, this one was published in the uh, Fredericksburg Review uh, and uh, a couple of years ago. How do you know when to die? I don't know when to die. Before the battle, I put on my belts and cartridge box, my haversack and canteen, and tote my rifle to where we are to form a battle line. I guess some people may flip coins and draw straws, conspire with friends to create the effect of a canister shot. All I've ever done is march around with everyone else. When we get to a ridge line, or when they halt just behind a tree line, I will think about the work I put into that day. If my legs are tired, I will die. If the battlefield is long and we have, march, we have to march up and downhill, I will die. I've died in camp before, when a bacterium settled on my dried beef. One of the things you do in camp is drink heavily and pretend to be wobbling on a cartoon soldier. Everyone walking through the company streets will stop and laugh until the other soldiers tie you to a tree and fire into you. When the people in camp leave for another camp, maybe I get up and carry on to stack firewood to see if the, my tack is stored and dry or fold patchwork quilts. When the drummer lo rolls assembly, I'll dress out and march. If my rifle misfires, then I will die. I forgot to mention that. 
I will die on a patch of cool grass or soft, damp soil. I will die and look up to a black cloud over a battlefield. Nobody sees me or know me, knows me, but I look up and wonder about God or lightning or absence or moving on all at once and forgetting everything else before the light goes out. Oh, yeah. I, sorry that I had to I had to read this a little. Uh, I get I get a little overwhelmed. This I wrote um, uh, uh, the morning after a certain election in 2016. The ever and the after. Votes are cast as is the die. The Rubicon crossed. The ship sailed. Train left station. Blues riff after blues riff. Echo a ways down tempo to where anyone with a lick of sense is pondering dirt molecules on a speckled linoleum floor at two in the morning. Left to wonder by proxy, why must the dirt accumulate itself in the absence of our eyes? And one day we open ourselves to the smut, speak out the numbers of words to describe how great our halls were in the day, how marked and scuffed they've become in this dark time. Archives will be a bitch to understand away from our lives. Nobody will understand our poems or ref our reference to a Facebook, the Twitter, whatever kind of thing that may not make the next century. We are well on our way. Some of us posting phrases that others of us know have no bearing on reality. And then we are the ones to have to come to reality. This is now, not in the books, away from the papers. The Twitter characters are stone. The Facebook posts are poems pounded into a Pantone 7455C monument. Mon moments stretch into songs at the end, or at least of the question, what do we do now? Answers in ourselves, written out and stored in a cloud, we thumb type them at night when our backs are too sore to sleep. When the sirens outside are relentless and driving smoke inhalation victims up another impossible hill, our eyeballs wide to the notion that when we go to work and miss a signal, we'll be shot when we are too slow to show our hands on the wheel. And so we rise to find the suitable chair in which to cradle our phones and tap the specifics of what we felt when we crossed over. What is what was it loss or once was a realization of what we never really had? We type it out and maybe our thumbs work us back into sleep. Maybe we slip away for a few more hours. Maybe we'll awaken to something new that isn't a messaging tool or any other online application. Maybe in our loss of words to unkept monuments, we find the movement we need to take us away from the depths and bring to us a return. Okay, I'm going to read this kind of a, I just hit on this. Um, I don't have much of one. So uh, I, I guess maybe I, I use that as a, um, uh, a device to squeeze a poem out. Uh, Vita, I have no Vita. I have a bachelor's of degree in Southern history and um, use it a whole lot uh, in everything I do, um, including writing poems and thinking about other things and all sorts. Uh, Vita. Somewhere standing in a forest, I have no hands clapping. Palms gone from clammy to frostbite red. Before the darkness, I have to get somewhere. Sometimes the mines are not buried, my engineer says. My engineer also has to dig a hasty position and fall into it. Uncup your hands and bury them in the fold of your 40-year-old gut. Between a forest and a field, I blink between a desk and a room where a tree can fall all day and nobody has the key card to get in and hear the report. I answer because a father asked and gave me the time at hands of the dead man's de of the dead one's peace. A at a foot is the distance end to end of a platinum chain kept in a pelvic observatory fronting my genitals. I hear the report and prepare a hasty plan to reach the concertina 
The map tells me the bird in the hand becomes a leaf in the sea. For me to look upon the silk, I must trace its either inked service, surface. What is to stare at the typing from my desk becomes a weapon from the wood. To find the sea in wilderness without body is to find snow falling at a time to be determined by a father who will join the dead. I move when I feel my hands again. I will see trees begin to fall back from a forest and become a sea. When I'm at rocks, the time will pass when I can put down my engineer, pull my vision off of the map and think of for myself again. Part of this, I think, is when I wrote when I wrote this, um, I didn't realize how many dad poems I have in there, and I don't have as many mom poems because my mom was with me all the time, and she was she was uh, an open book, and uh, thankfully I I was able to access her to this day um, about anything and everything, and we have a, a, a strong relationship. Dad was a little bit different. Uh, uh, his uh, he was. Uh, uh, open guy, uh, a kind and loving guy, and, and uh, at the same time uh, was somewhat of a mystery to me as I grew up. Um, so anyway, I, I, I wrote a bunch of poems about him uh, in this book, um, Convergent. You see that? My father points to the M14 the soldier has at inspection arms before the tomb of the unknown soldier. My father goes on and on about the part of the rifle. I learn a new word, component. My father, the trooper, my father, the chaplain's assistant, father, the specialist, the company man, the teller of secrets behind the Cuban Missile Crisis. You see him? My father points at a fading Ted Williams in short left before the green monster. My father goes on about being a left-handed Wofford Terrier, a fleet terrier, coming out to take over from the splendid splinter, 521 home runs, Marine in World War II, Korea. My father's tale about breaking his collarbone against the monster and the Red Sox manager giving the nod to young Carl Yastrzemski. My father, the storyteller. My father knew ministers, but not as many as they did models of cars. My father picked apart the plots of TV shows to find the cherries of the car models on display at the backlot towns. Look at that. My father points to a dusty and rusty sedan that Goober takes apart and puts back together in the courthouse. My father tells me the car was a Nash or a Rambler, and he tells me Nash and Rambler converged to form American Motors. My father, the car historian. My father, the executive, central, executive center general manager who walked me around buildings under construction to look for slugs cut from electrical boxes that made me feel rich because they felt like quarters that I could use to get a bottle of orange crush from the machine to the break room. Look, he points to me. My father, the double bypass recipient, goes on to tell me how he won't be around by the time I turn 50. And my father, the tactician, tells me that maybe I won't be around either because that governor who died on the treadmill, because these are the danger years. My father, the former smoker, my father, the alcohol dependent, restless retiree with no hobbies other than wise comments, a father of me, a soldier, a car driver, father, smart aleck, component to my son, convergent in them. If, hold on one second, I've got to do a little thing. My other computer locked up, I got to. Apologies for that. Um, I, I have some poems set up on my office computer that I'm going to go through. Um, I ended with that one. Um, he was still alive at that time, but uh, he was not such a great condition. Uh, anyway, he, um, we'll, we'll get around to that. Um, the next bunch of poems, they're not published yet, and I, I really have got to say I'm not really good at submitting. Uh, it's just uh, time could be a, an issue, uh, but I'm, I'm resolved to getting some of these things sent out. Um, I will... Um, Part of at the at the start of the COVID thing, uh, the COVID thing, um, 
I the whole lockdown thing. I I started writing in this. Uh, I guess to this this sort of prompt of of write a blue song, and I have no musical qualities at all. And I titled all of these uh, poems, and I guess you'd call a cycle, blue song. And I, I there there were like thirty of them. I'm not going to read them all, <laughs> but uh, I, I I picked out a couple of them uh, that I'd like to share. Um, let me see. Um, one of them, I think this is the one about midway through the whole thing, and and uh, it was a. Um, I guess I, I started making fun of my own my own cycle. Um, blue song for want of a blues song. I cannot think of a blues riff in G for staying at home while people go to Lowe's to buy their dreams hammered into kitchen cabinet. What? Orchestration. Nor can I feel the better in pulling flatbread and rolling meat, cheese, and spinach into it five minutes after closing out the last of my email. But before waiting on the man to call me back to talk about the disappointment of a pristine park and the hope of the world to come when we ride, when we get into the cars to drive roadways scattered in the failings of the best hopes of trees and spring. What kind of drive is it to search the world for ourselves among the poked whole planes of metal shells? I'm all for perf for finding the perfect fit inside a soft tweed jacket to go with the blue jeans my wife bought for my birthday. I love finding pot pies ready to bake, fries brought to the table with an end of the world steak. Such a feeling of draping a long neck around my fingers to swing and feel the cold suds on the back of my throat. So feel the honor of concrete unreached and the footing of the repurposed brick buildings along the off street that catch what's left of the light before the guitars pick up and the ovens dispense their bread and buffalo burgers to the crowd within wax paper crumbling the shuffles under the sound of let it go man let all this stomach chasing hunt for heaven go blue song for the telephone to goodbye you could be finished with your grits. You could be mid-swallow in your coffee when the mother calls and says he's slumped and leaning away. There are mother calls asking what to do today. Go to the store, find some dolls at the thrift shop for a granddaughter in college who stays up until six, thinking of what to do when the order is gone. There are calls of wanting to make the bed up so he can sleep, but he's lying on the floor and she can't pick him up. Calls about the still bills stacked up on the kitchen counter that have already been paid online. Calls about what to do when he's poured another glass of wine, but she just wants him to go to sleep. One call comes as the coffee goes down, and you know what it is for. The one call that produces hundreds more, along with long drives in the dark and frozen positions in old neighborhoods that happen before the signings, holding the one good hand probing the one left thumb for that flutter or a twitch that phones you into the Alamo inside his brain. One more dial into him, one last visit, until the next and the next, this celestial telephone buzzing with the dad fades into pictures of fit soldiers and fleet terriers. This call becomes ongoing, the one calling never to be dropped. Uh, the last one of this bunch that I did, um, I just called it comfort song for the visiting. Um, for weeks leading up to the cold afternoon, he talked of daddy stopping by for a visit, stopping off the road for a cup of coffee on his way to visit Ken. He's been busy since he died, he said about daddy, as he rolled down the hall to, to, to fall into his old soldier body into a lowered bed. Mom called for weeks leading up to the cold afternoon and told us she had to make up the bed for him to lie in it. She had to move the covers from up from wrinkles at the foot to the crest of the head where the pillows went and smooth down the lumps that her husband makes when he talked of daddy coming by in this house that wasn't his, but for the living in, in it, he couldn't see. 
For years leading up to the hot afternoon, when the driveway burned feet and the wind fell still, he signed checks that kept the churches running, the shaken warmed, the lost found, checks written on social security and the time he spent earning it weaving door to door, visiting tenants, staying too late at the office cafe with the guys to talk shit. He wrote the cars of his life, riding the seat of a recliner under the shadow of daddy, his picture frozen in arms behind his back and gazing through horn-rimmed glasses to a dutiful son, studying the chrome details of the 50-some cars that burst in his mind when the evening comes and mom is not yet home from her escape to the Salvation Army. Decades leading up to the evening of the elevator and the television rerun were children and singers, cars and whiskey, good business, and always Jesus. Jesus always nearby, speaking his mind in curt accord with the man who could teach and the man who taught a symphony of replies from one car lot to the next executive center and all the disciples of good business scurrying in between the rights of way. Moments leading up to the last breath, he dragged the oxygen through his throat. Five days, stubble ringed his face, hair a stiffened fire, silver against the pillow. A black and white comedy show played about above the bed with the comic wide-eyed and pleading with the mushroom on the bench to spit out the name of the perpetrator. Such an episode seen by his closed eyes 52 times in 55 years. His mouth stays open, eyes shut and rolled up to Jesus. Jesus, the way he's sung each day leading up to the moment, wherever it's dealt, into the universe of universes, when daddy wanders in and looks through the trifocals at his sleeping son, picks him up without waking him, and walks him to his any kind of Chrysler with the Chevy Chrome and Ford convertible Detroit cylinder frame, four wheels underneath lime grain cherry red heaven on the highway, sets his body down and whispers to him, we've got company to see. That's one of some, um, uh, and in the, in the throes of the, the, the last year, um, I, I might say I'm a little bit stir crazy and I'm very thankful that I have you around me and that we're all talking and listening because I've, I've, um, I'm a loner myself and like to get around. I want to do one more. Um, and it's the first thing I typed in several months of inactivity. Uh, and I promise I'll be done. Uh, the first poem. It doesn't matter what you felt when you hit your toe on that green chair. It doesn't bother anyone to think about you when you come upon the clipping that fell from your knife four Julys ago when the apartment was so close you nearly passed out while cutting those legs at the collage table. The helicopter pilot is not concerned that your understanding of the drop zone is too oblong and sloped for any sort of decent landing. Your son is not affected by the cleanliness you feel when you pack up the sketchbooks and art supplies and put all the boxes of them into his room. No one has the book you wrote about the time in the White House when you heard the men one man swear to the other man that the thing is supposed to be the way we want it, we want it and not the way we say it is. And the book you want to write about basketball and the one about the highway and the one about the world traveling gun doesn't mean much to the jacks plunging down the shafts to extract minerals, and they surely are not moved by poems about clean air and clean water, or the teak benches in a tall grass lot hiding God knows how many empty cans and how much mercury. God knows he can count on you to know that you don't know anything about the storyline with the locusts and the floating baby. You may not be concerned with the television show about the people trying to be kings or kill kings, and the thing with the single guy picking a wife may as well be Road Warrior Animal watching Road Warrior Hawk go off the top rope to elbow smash Bobby Eaton in the face while his partner Dennis Condry and 8,000 wrestling fans bring Civic Center bring the Civic Center into a rattle of thumps and chairs. Your memories pass in front of your loved people the way the Dodges, Fords, and Chevys pass the porch of the grandmother's sister who fried the better chicken. It doesn't matter about the egos or the yet to comes, what you think or how they react. Very little concern for what the temperature is outside, for when you can stand up and walk to the door, open it and feel the feeling of what is right now on your face and moving through you as if you were there and not there, flickering in form or whether on whether to make the day at home or away. 
thank you very much for your time. I'm, I'm sorry if I overran a little bit. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Worthy. Thank you so much. I'm, we're going to have a brief Q&A at the end. Can you stick around for that? Yes, I sure can. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so up, up next, we have the poet Kalisa Ray. Kalisa is a poet and journalist in Durham, North Carolina, that speaks with furious rebellion. She is the author of Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat, just launched from Red Hen Press. Her essays are featured in Auto Straddle, Catapult, Lid Hub, as well as articles in Bitch Media, NBC, BLK, and others. Her poetry appears in Frontier Poetry, Florida Review, Rust and, Rust and Moth, Pink, Hellebore, Sundog Lit, Hobart, and others. She is the winner of the Bright Wings Poetry Contest, the Furious Flower Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Prize, and the White Stag Publishing Contest, among others. Currently, she serves as assistant editor for Glass Poetry and co-founder of Think in Ink and the Women of Color Speak Reading Series. Her second collection, Unlearning Eden, is forthcoming from White Stag in 2022. I'm going to post links to her website, but with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Kalisa Ray. Hey, Kalisa. Hey, how's it going? Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Carolina Poets. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, and read um, with both Worthy and my friend Crystal. So this is a delight and a pleasure. Um, I'm gonna be reading poems today from my debut forthcoming, or not forthcoming anymore, it already came out. I'm so used to saying forthcoming. Um, I've been on a book tour for the last month and a half for Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat, uh, which is my first full length collection, not my first collection. Um, my first collection was Real Girls Have World Problems published by J.Car Press. Uh, so I owe a lot to the Carolinas for um, really believing in my work. And then uh, Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat uh, was actually my master's uh, thesis at Queens University in Charlotte that was published by Red Hymn Press. Um, so I'll be reading poems from that tonight. And then at the end, I'll read a poem or two from Unlearning Eden because uh, I'm really excited about uh, my next book after this one. Um, I uh, have been on a tour, as I said, trying to um, really spread as much word, I guess you could say, as possible about um, what the book is about because I think it's really important. Uh, so I'm not a native of North Carolina. Uh, if you couldn't tell by my non-regional diction, I am from uh, a place called Gary, Indiana, where Michael Jackson was born. And so Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat uh, talks all about my transition, transition into college and getting to the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, as a young, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed 18 year old uh, black woman and thinking I was going to have an amazing time in college and being shocked by trauma and learning about the Wilmington 1898 race massacre uh, and how that knocked me on my feet. Um, the unbelievable racism that I experienced uh, in the town and just learning about that uh, and the history of uh, violence that happened in the town and the unsettling feeling that I felt and that everybody talks about when you come to Wilmington. Um, and so the book traverses, you know, me being a survivor of trauma coming to a place of trauma and learning about ghosts, but also calling upon my ancestors to get through. Uh, with that, I will read this first poem that piggybacks right off, off of that. Uh, this is called Southern Foreclosures. And it, many people knew it as 10 things um, or 10 reasons why I will never call the South home. For the book, we uh, changed it to Southern Foreclosures and you'll see why. And this is, a, this is a list piece. One, long back roads still rattle me, still make me fear being asked to step out, the nightstick, the gun, body turned to roadkill, left on curb, forgotten. Two, pitch black nights reminds me the torch, deep fried flesh, tarred and feathered, watching bodies swing like gruesome drive-in films. Three, open fields, leather whips, raking fingers through gra glass, grass, blood, sweat leathered cotton, body parts left out for fertilizer. Four, Farm animals grazing remind me of the buying and selling of meat, the ripping baby, 
for mother for consumption, the burning and the branding, the slaughter, the hanging out to dry like jerky. Five, big plantation houses remind me of house slave and field Negro, maid and mistress, dinner service, browns bodies, expensive ornaments fresh off the auction block. Six, state fairs still remind me of, come see the hanging Negro, where can I place my bid? This one has strong back, good teeth and broad shoulders, not the whole family, how much for the little boy and girl? Seven, hunting season and wild woods remind me of running through forests, bullets grazing black skulls, branches cutting ankles, underground railroads hiding under the creek from coon dogs sniffing out the smell of a runaway. Eight, the Cape Fear River reminds me of the drowning, throwing bodies over the bridge to hide the evidence, the vanishing of whole families, how they threw us over ships like rotten catfish. Nine, boxing matches remind me of strapping black brutes fighting for bets, bare knuckled knocking out until unconscious for entertainment, toasting to the tearing of flesh smoking a cigar in celebration when one was dead. 10, Southern Belle and sweet tea smells like centuries of injustice. 11, Southern comfort tastes like privilege. 12, Southern hospitality sounds too unsettling to ever feel like home. Uh, so that piece for me really encompasses what it was like. Um, as an 18 year old uh, coming to the South and um, hearing the matriarchs in North Carolina talk all about the history of the South and me not knowing anything about that. Um, I was really upset when, you know, I, I found out that the history books just totally left out so many incidences, you know, not just Wilmington, but Tulsa uh, and so many other places um, that had massacres and, and whole annihilations of races happen and, and that's not talked about. And so in the book, I really grapple with like uh, the ghost that haunt me because there was an unknowing, uh, if you will. And so um, I sometimes tell people that this, this book is almost like a novel written in verse, if you will, because it tells the story of me um, and all of the things that I had to contend with, my own personal uh, hauntings and trauma met with uh, the additional baggage of being a black woman um, and the South that felt othered. And so this next piece um, is based on Van Gogh's piece, Starry Night. And when I was in my master's program, um, we had to really sit and ponder about an art piece and write about it from a different perspective. And so I responded to Van Gogh's piece uh, from a from a black woman's perspective. And this is Van Gogh paints a hymn. This is the piece that was chosen as a Gwendolyn Brooks uh, prize winner. We are the sheet music of Van Gogh's memory. Charred shrubberies crashing our symbols against the blue backdrops, jagged and sharp. Our notes wave to the yellow stars flashing above us vibrant. Our melodies black and daunting, a single note planted amidst a sorry night. Behind us, everyone sleeps to the swoosh of wind while our choir belts out another praise hymn in the foreground. Our black bodies reaching skyward, singing hallelujah, praise him to a God always unseen. You know, um, when writing this book, I really had to contend with a lot of the, the memories that I say that I um, brought back from the fire, which is why my book is separated into sections that are um, earth, wind, wire, water, fire, fire, spirit. Um, and because I had to recall a lot of things that I suppressed or ghosts that were in my throat that I didn't want to talk about, that I was told to hush, um, and so the book talks about a lot. And one of those is code switching. Um, when I was growing up, I was told that I looked just like Raven Simone, the actress from The Cosby Show. Uh, we look identical, identical in our baby pictures. And I wrote a letter to her um, because she said some things about America being colorless on uh, Oprah's show. And that really struck, that really hurt. 
uh, that she erased herself and erased us uh, as, as black and brown folks. And so I wanted to talk to her. This is called American Made. You undress your skin so easily as if this ethnicity were a hoodie on a hot day and you thought it best to take off before recognized or assumed when the weight of your identity became a burden, you simply refused to carry it on this journey as a brown woman. But who are we kidding, Raven? We were both the light-skinned girl everyone in school asked what you mix with. We were both on the playground when Billy Sanford pulled our hair and said we talk white, both the only black girl on the cheerleading team and weren't invited to the team sleepover. We both got a rude awakening when our teacher changed our A paper to an F, but we stay trying to remove all that dead weight and tool, all these centuries of Ghanaian beating and Cape Town stitch work like they don't know where we were made. We stay climbing inside someone else's silhouette, trying to oblier unzip this Montclair passing skin, but I will always be the black ball gown in a room full of white wedding dresses. And I am reminded every day against this taffeta backdrop drop of muted hues and random fabrics, equality turns into invisibility the longer you exist. Saying I don't see color means I don't see you. You have made sameness another word for silent erasure. And I don't want you silent, girl. Not when there is still so much to say. Thank you. Um, I love that piece so much because, uh, so I did my master's thesis, I think, with the best poets in the world. Uh, Claudia Rankin and uh, Ada Limon, they were my professors in grad school. And when I wrote that piece, Claudia read it and was like, whoa, this is powerful, but we've got to like get to the heart of the matter so she can hear you. <laughs> so we really like distilled that poem down um, and really uh, made it about brevity and just saying like exactly what I needed to tell her. Um, this next piece as I kind of um, come to a close uh, with Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat and then I'll read a piece from my other collection. Uh, as I said, I talk about many topics that plague women and girls, especially BIPOC women and, and women identified folks. And so uh, being a survivor of trauma is one of those. This is livestock. Um, and this is another one that I love to read because it makes me feel empowered. When they come for me, I am neither girl nor boy. I am neither clam nor cock. I have neither hooves nor snout, but I do have claws. I can grunt and growl and show my teeth. I do not need wings to create a windstorm. I do not need talons to break skin. I can snarl and scrape. I can unhinge my jaw to fit a head twice the size of mine inside. I can be razor backed and spiked edge when he tries to skin me to unscale my silvery back, debone my brazen hen hide. I will be foul mouth and crooked neck. I will be the chicken head they knew me to be if it will save my life. When he comes for me, I will remember the coup, how they gathered the foul girl up by the feet with warm hands and cooing, how her brown hung low when they entered her into the guillotine and severed her head, how they plucked her body until she was bare. I will remember the blood and what happens when they want to make you food. I love that piece so much because when I was growing up, my mom always taught me to fight my way out um, of any situation that I get, get into. If I'm in a dark alley and someone comes up behind me, girl, you better, you better claw. And so that's where that piece came from. I remember when I wrote that and was working on it in my thesis and was laughing with Ada just about um, how she has similar pieces that talk about like the animal inside of the woman and how people un underestimate uh, women and girls so often. Um, this last piece that I want to read, as I said, I wanted to make sure that I showed like a gamut tonight of the subjects that I talk about, um, in this book, particularly, uh, heirloom, uh, talks all about mental health and how we silence, uh, mental health in the black community, the black and brown communities. And so it was really important for me to talk about, um, like I said, like all of the traumas that I've been through that were stuck, 
lodged right here that I was always told not to talk about. And so we're going to talk about it today, though. It's called heirloom. We inherit this loneliness, a gentle passing down from one generation to generation like a secret family recipe. No one knows the ingredients that made this delicious mess, but we ingest it, swallow each prideful piece, bury the weight of solitude in the junk drawer of our genes. With every new child, a new symptom is added. It is an unspoken truth. A fog has hovered over our heads for decades, generations of grandmothers and grandfathers that were chronically melancholy, great aunts and uncles passing with loneliness, following them like ghosts. The room in our brains is haunted, but we do not speak of this terror. We never mention the thoughts that keep sleep so distant, the sadness that gnaws at our sanity. God forbid we ask for help. Too much to be colored and crazy. Too many double-edged swords could kill a man. So we suffer in silence, tuck our secrets back in and save them for a rainy day. It's so funny. Um, I say that this book allowed me to be fearless enough to have coming out. Um, so I think that it was meant to be um, that I wrote these these poems that I was that I was honestly scared to write um, because I needed that. So I had the voice to write every book that comes after this. Um, my heart was like touched tonight. And before I transition to this last piece from Unlearning Eden. I wanted to read um, what one of my professors said is one of their favorite pieces in the book. And it was re recently featured by uh, the Writer's Almanac. And I was I was so honored that it was chosen. And so I want to read that and then I'll transition and, and turn it over for Q&A. It's called Wind Watching. watching um, and it's a great transition uh, to that like freedom that I'm talking about that I got from writing this book. What if Dorothy wasn't afraid of the wind? What if she welcomed the cyclone? Thought of being lifted, suspended in air as a release. What if she saw it as an escape, being tossed and jolted? Maybe a change would occur if she shook fast enough. Maybe she liked not knowing if her body would survive the catch and release. Maybe being picked up and let go in another's chaos was spring. I imagined she was raptured before the light of day had kissed the earth. The swirl approached and she went willingly, threw her head and arms back and let it consume her. Maybe she had been waiting to be swept off her feet by a wild, uncontrollable thing. Thank y'all so very much. I'm gonna leave you just with, uh, so you can get a little taste of what Unlearning Eden is all about. These poems are all um, published. You can find uh, the work in various literary magazines, um, except for Southern Foreclosures, which is forthcoming. And then you can find this last piece, uh, My Grandmother Never Spoke of the Body in Rust and Moth. Thank y'all again so much for having me. My grandmother never spoke of her body. In my dream, she is under a man that knows about satisfaction and indulgence, a giver and a pleaser, one that doesn't hand over the chocolate but rubs the morsel on your lips, leans his limbs down to the center of her mouth and says, here, take. In my dream, I came from pleasure, from men that believe the art arch in her back was medicine for aging hands that foreplay cures cataracts better than thc and all good pipes burst when tapped at the right place in my dreams she is body embraced and thirsting for more she is gushing knowing dying in ecstasy would be a sweet death that anticipation is the realest form of feminism there is. Thank y'all again so much. Please, please, please be looking for Unearning, Unlearning Eden. It's a uh, YA novel written in verse about coming into your body and sexuality and having those conversations with the matriarchs. 
Uh, and then again, my debut collection from Red Hen Press. I'm so proud of it. It's Ghost in a Black Girl's Throat. We'll put a link in the chat. Please get it. Follow me online uh, to find the other places I'll be reading throughout my tour uh, as that's coming to a close here in the next month. Thank you all again so much for having me. This was a joy. Lisa, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm going to add everybody back to the screen here. And, Cleese, I know you said you may have to drop off, so just do that when you need to. No problem at all. I will give you the first question if you do have a minute. And that question is, how has the pandemic impacted your work, if at all? Are the themes, did you find the themes of your work changing at all during this time? Yeah, I think so, because... I've been writing a lot about community and I never realized how impactful being around other writers was for my writing. And so I think it's not only literally impacted the content, but it's also influenced uh, the topic um, and the way, the way I write, my writing practice. So if uh, you know anything about my history in North Carolina, I've started like three different women's feminist literary organizations. And just imagine going from having a whole community of 10 other women identified folks writing with you and encouraging you and keeping you accountable as Worthy was saying to submit and go out there and enter contests. And then that completely changes. And so not only does that change your motivation, but I think it also makes you talk a lot about grief. I've been writing a lot about the loss of friends um, because during the pandemic, there were just friends that I don't, you know, haven't talked to in a while, but also I've talked about in my work, the loss of that communal space uh, and what that does to your mental health as well. And I think that, yeah, my topics have definitely uh, been been changed and I have to be more motivated now to write because I had that loss of community. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess we're all kind of craving, you know, getting that back, right? So I'll ask the same question to you, Crystal. Um, did the pandemic change your writing in any way? Did you find new themes or uh, tell us about how it impacted your work? I think you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, changed, it changed my, my writing tremendously. Um, I had the opposite uh, response to COVID. Um, I just wrote a lot and I was, you know, and for me, writing for me is, is a, a little different. Like I, I never sit down and say, well, I need to give myself X amount of time and X amount of time or any, you know, I kind of am really a, po a poet who, writes from the moment, right? So if something happens, it's almost like occasional poetry. I got to pen it. I got to write about it. I got to. And so when uh, COVID happened, I'm a bit of an extroverted person and I'm, I'm high energy and I go, go, go all the time, really until I crash. And that's when I, you know, go to sleep. <laughs> but um, I really went into sort of a, a depression because it was a shutdown. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't talk to people. And I, will, I wasn't a, fun, a, a fan of uh, Zoom and all of that. So, um, I, and then of course things began to happen and it, you know, Ahmaud Arbery died, George Floyd died. And I have two sons and my older son is also a distance runner who runs in our really, you know, our nice community. And um, and so I, I went. I was really depressed, and I hit a, a, a low. And so I just started writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And I and I actually have work now that that will be published and 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 so forth. But um, it was a it was an opposite for me because I was at the lowest. I mean, I don't remember being this low ever before. So I was at the lowest. And sometimes, you know, I've heard Ta-Nehisi Coates talk about writing, you know, his his famed um, prize winning novel when he was at his absolute lowest. So it it, it worked out for me, unfortunately. I mean, I, that's all I have to say. I, I wrote some of the best stuff uh, during COVID. So. Yeah, and I kind of relate to that. You know, we a lot of times people make these judgments about poets and we're all introverts, but some of us are extroverts and I need that community. And, and it was uh, you know, frustrating to not not have that. Yeah. Worthy, what about your work? Did you experience uh, discover new themes or uh, did your writing habits change during this pandemic? Um, I think, yeah, for one thing, um, I think I'm, I usually have a notebook and I, I, I before going into the COVID, I, I would uh, jot off at least a poem a day, uh, or not a poem, but a, a piece 
uh, a couple of pages that I think in uh, over the next couple of years, I would look to uh, shape it out and see what it's going to tell me. Um, that stopped. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I am an introvert by by far. Uh, my wife's an extrovert, so we, we, we kind of feed off of each other that way. Um, and I, I really, you know, the, 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 with all the restrictions and everything that didn't bother me a lick, uh, and, and the isolation, I'm pretty good with that too. Uh, however, one thing I've noticed is I think when the poems stopped or when the, the pieces that would be poems would, had stopped, I think, um, what I didn't take into consideration for is how much I need outside <laughs> and how much that connection and that daily communication was vital to my daily renderings of what what was to be. Uh, and and on the, on, in lieu of that, uh, I went back to my journal. I kept the journal for about 30 years and I had quit it in recent years. And, and I started writing um, daily or every other daily accounts of just about everything, every single thing. Um, uh, and, and it was a tough time. Like I said, um, my father died last year just at the start of COVID, unrelated. He had a stroke. Um, and that, that triggered the, the, and I lost a dear coworker. Uh, she, she had just died overnight one night, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, um, totally unexpected. And, um, not only that, and there were a couple of three COVID deaths that hit me pretty hard too. Um, not to mention the crap that the, the George Floyd and, and all of this stuff that has been there for, oh my gosh been there for hundreds of years but finally i guess people are finally coming around to realizing um there was a lot that went on and i and i guess what i saw in my work was that um uh, you know i had my connections cut off and i didn't even think that i had connections being an introvert so um it's you learn about yourself something about yourself every day um, we did get one question from Robert Cohen in the chat, and he asked, how long have you written poetry? And I would just add to that, you know, maybe you could tell us about how your evolution uh, with poetry came about. Kalisa, I'll start with you, because again, I know you're a little pressed for time. Sure. Um, so I always, I get asked this a lot, and I have a funny little like background, which is that when I was uh, six, my mom says is when I started writing. Uh, I started writing, um, it's funny how me and speaking of that poem about Raven, it's funny about how um, like figures from media would show up, my mom said, when I was young. So I used to like actually write a lot about the Cosby show when I was younger and I wrote like my own version. Uh, so she has these Tupperware uh, bins, these Ziploc bins of my work from when I was six. And so I'm 35 now, so just like count those amount of years. But um you know my the evolution has changed a lot because i used to um want to write for film and i wanted to turn my novels and those stories uh into to film and tv and it's funny i come full circle because i'm back there my sister's a filmmaker and so i i decided to instead uh study creative writing through college and and uh do performance poetry as well as academia and teach it uh, and now I've come kind of full circle because I'm back to querying my novel that's coming out. Uh, and it's uh, a novel that's written for for uh, film, for movies. So um, I've kind of come full circle with my my journey. But yeah, I've been writing since I was six years old uh, and I'm 35. So I have so many years ahead of me. But yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, Chris, how about you? Tell us about how long you've been writing and maybe something about your journey. Um, yep. I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so I kind of, um, a lot like Kalisa, I've always been writing. I was the editor of my college newspaper, and I thought for a long time I would go into journalism, and I, I realized very quickly that I didn't like journalism. Uh, mm -hmm. I was, one day I was an intern, and I was on with, with the newscaster, and we were having to interview a woman whose daughter had, his four-year-old daughter had just been killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and things like that, and I and I just thought this is not for me. <laughs> and so I um I still liked writing, but I kind of abandoned it and put it aside and did other things and went to art school and became a graphic designer. And um, it actually, it was the the um, event of of my parents' death. They died within two years of each other. Wow. My father died of cancer, and then my mother died two years later in a car accident. Mm -hmm. And um, and at the time I had a nine month old, my, my son. And I was just, it was really hard to get my head around all of that. And so 
I thought I'd start writing memoir and because I wanted to sort of capture my childhood and those moments for my children. Because I, I, I thought if I don't get these down while they're still fresh in my head, then I, I don't know what I'll tell them about my parents. And so um, I started writing memoir and I liked it, but then I, I, I just, I couldn't write at length. And so they started to become poems. They started to become kind of, yeah. And so then I, I started writing poetry. And, and at that point, I, I was not a well-read poet. I, I, could, I could probably name five poets, to be honest with you, on, on one hand. Um, but I was naturally lyrical, probably because I had an obsession with hip hop when I was younger. So I was naturally lyrical. I could just do it. And it was easy to do. And I wrote one poem and I showed it to a friend who was a poet. And she was like, send that out. And I was like, where am I sending this to? <laughs> and I sent it, I sent it to the African American Review and they published it. So I published poi poetry before I was even a poet. And so that publication sort of uh, was the kind of jump off uh, for me to want to pursue life as a poet. And then it just, once it jumped off, I just kept, kept writing and it kept going. That's great. Um, Worthy, how long have you been writing? there um i've you know i'd written since i was a kid I, I enjoyed writing but i didn't really think about anything i started writing my journal um uh, i think at i think november 17th 1997 and uh in the middle of class i just decided i'd write a journal entry uh and then not long after that i, I wrote i guess my first poem because there was this girl and you know a 16 year old hormones um <laughs> Uh, but it, it was much more than that. I, I think the, the the form of that, uh, the, the I, short lack of better word, magic of writing words and verse, uh, just, God, I really loved it. And I wrote a lot uh, in the later part of high school and in college, um, submitted to the, the literary journal at College of Charleston, and it got accepted. And um, I did that a couple of times there. Um, took a couple of poetry writing classes there, and I, uh, uh, I'm, I, know, I don't like saying I'm self-taught because I, I think everybody, everybody in my life taught me something, and and part of that was uh, I, I just well, I hook or by crook, I found a poet here and a poet there that I liked and I glommed onto, uh, and went to from there to there and tried out styles and liked what this person did. What if I copied it and all this and, um, but. You know, like I said, life happened and I graduated from college, had no idea what I was going to do with a history degree. So I joined, I, I enlisted in the Army, went as a, an, uh, an E-4 off enlisted man. And um, that's where I did my, my graduate school of life. And that sort of dropped, it didn't stop the poetry, but uh, it, 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 I guess, put it on the back burner and, and then got into newspapers, um, did a lot of writing there. And I guess that, that, that satisfied the the, the need to type out things. Um, uh, I fell into sports writing. I'm not, uh, I, I always looked at box scores in the newspaper, but I'm not what you call, what you would consider your typical sports nerd. Um, but uh, I, I write about it to this day. I've, I've got an assignment tomorrow night and I had one last week. But anyway, uh, one thing I found out with, after 10 years of sports writing, um, how easy it was to get back into poems. I, I just started writing poems after I quit my job and got into Medicare. Um, I had plenty of time on my hands to think. And when I did, I consulted how to write a sports article and how uh, uh, there, there's a certain way you write a sports article on deadline. And I, I employed that in my writing and out came poems. First time, 14 years, poem to poem, to poem, one after the other, after the other, not particularly good. Um, but they were they were fun exercises and they still are. Um, so, yeah, and, and that, you know, one thing to the other that way. Um, but, yeah, it's a lot of writing and a lot of experience and a lot of, um, like I said, having teachers everywhere. Yeah, so that uh, sports writing taught you something about that, that structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah structure so, and uh, strength of sentences, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask one final question. Let's do this kind of in a fast round robin, if we will. Um, Paul Jones has asked us, um, he's, he says he's published three books of poetry. His question is how to get your books out there, I guess, to have uh, readers discover your work. And just in a sentence or two, if you have any advice for Paul, we'll start with Kalisa. 
Perfect. I was just about to message you to let you know I had to run. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. So I like sharing my story about how I got my book published because I think it's inspiring to keep uh, persevering. Um, so when I, um, I kind of took a semi-traditional route with um, my book now, it was my, my master's thesis. But I say all that to say that, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be your journey. Um, I got it published because I randomly went to AWP, went to the AWP conference with a friend and was passing by the uh, table that I didn't even know the press. It ended up being Red Hen and uh, was waiting on a friend. The guy asked me, um, hey, come over, check out our books. And I was like, OK. And he says, what are you working on? And I think it was just fate, you know, for him to ask me that because he was saying he didn't even, you know, he didn't even work for it again. So I was like, who is this guy? So he's like, what are you working on? And I said, I'm working on uh, getting my book, my master's thesis out there. And he's like, okay, who were aware? Oh, I was like, Queens. He said, who did you study under? And the minute I told him who my professors were, I said, Claudia uh, Rankin and Ada Limon. And he was like, uh, send that to me. And I was like, what? I was like, what? who's this guy, you know? And he's like, send me your manuscript. And I literally sat on his card for six months. And my husband was like, you're crazy. Call this guy. And the guy ended up being an acquisitioner for Red Hen. Um, and it just was like fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it. So I say all that to say that one network the heck out of every space you go into, you know, name drop and connect with as many authors as Worthy said as possible, you know, connect and talk to authors as much as possible. Uh, because you never know that person's name could get you in a door. Um, and then ask, you know, other other writers as well. Like, which press did you publish with? Um, ask them because you never know by saying, hey, my friend published with Finish Line or whatever, Milkweed. Uh, a lot of indie presses are looking for new voices. And so that would be, I guess, my advice. I wanted to share that story that Red Hen is actually a nonprofit like, indie press. And so they were like really excited to to publish somebody's forthcoming collection. So keep at it. Um, and keep pushing because I had sent it out. My last little thing I'll say is perseverance. I sent it out to about four other um, presses and then I entered in gobs of contest uh, and didn't get traction until after Red Hen wanted to pick it up. And then people were like, yeah, yeah, we want it too. Um, so I would definitely say like persevere, keep trying, keep sending it out. That's great advice. Writers need to know that one. So um, Felicia, if you need to drop off, thank you so much for joining us. And I'll just ask the, the same question to uh, Crystal, if you have any advice for Paul about trying to get his work out there. Well, Paul, I have to tell you, it's your lucky day because I'm a publisher. Uh, I am an indie uh, press owner. I founded Backbone Press uh, 10 years ago. Maybe we might be in our, our 11th year now. But um, so I will tell you quite, quite easily that there is a process, right? Um, you get your manuscript together. You know it's ready to go. And basically, I would go to Poets and Writers Directory. There are hundreds of small indie presses, hundreds of them. D take a day and visit them. You can actually query in uh, Poets and Writers Directory based upon what kind of poetry you write. Um, they have LBGTQ poetry. They, you know, Africa, some presses like my press focuses on voices of color and African-American uh, poetry. And so query, go, and then once you have that list and, and have all those websites, look at the presses and look and see what they're publishing, who they're publishing. Just, just spend a day, I, it's gonna take you longer than a day, but look at all of that and then just write down a few presses that you want to submit to. I would submit to more presses than less because a lot of us, um, we are, small presses have small budgets. That's just, uh, that's the honest to goodness truth. So we don't publish a lot each year. We, we may publish some some presses. I would say most publish five to six titles a year, some under five, some maybe 10, but they don't publish a lot a year. So just send out to a lot of presses um, and see what kind of feelers you get. So, you know, you get some people who, who um, just sort of turn you down. I mean, that happens to, I mean, that hasn't happened to I don't know a poet that that hasn't happened to that you've sent it out and you know so you're going to get a lot of that but like Kalisa said you're also going to get a few bites so that's that's the way to go poets and writers directory and just query and look at all of those small indie presses 
That's a great perspective, Crystal. Thanks for giving us kind of the publisher side. Mm -hmm. um, worthy. So do you have any advice for Paul? Um, he has self-published some work. Anyway, yeah, first, have... yeah. First of all, uh, Crystal and Kalisa are on point. That that really is it. Get to know get to know everybody, uh, all your contemporaries, uh, and they can you know like one thing leads to another. Submit to all the press. The poets and writers thing is great. Uh, I know I, I, there's not much I can add. Um, one thing I can tell you, maybe not worry about. Um, a lot of the presses, some of the bigger presses, will have poetry contests, and I've entered in a bunch of them, and I've, I've just I've stopped that. Uh, it's not. It's not helpful. I won't win, <laughs> uh, I, I, but th they are helpful. I guess that they uh, they give you they gave me at the time uh, an urgency. I think the, an artificial urgency to put some poems together cohesively into a four to, sort of manuscript. You know, but realistically, I've got ten of those suckers laying around, and um, you know what I think I really need to do better is is just shop for presses that might want to publish some some kind of things of my ilk and. Uh, go from there, um, but it's a it's a patient thing, and I tell you one one book leads to another. In my case, was it? I was reading from um, Cold War uh, Green Revolver in 2010 at the uh, the Nashville uh, was it the Tennessee uh, Book Festival, and uh, uh, I was reading with Tim Peeler, uh, another poet from the from Western North Carolina, and uh we read together and we shared each other's poems i loved what he was reading from was this his book checking out it's an awesome book about when he was um, a night desk clerk and he wrote his recollections and uh, a cycle of poems there and we we had a mutual admiration of each other's work i guess and and um put that in put that asleep eight years later um he sent me a text message Hey, Worthy, do you still write poems? <laughs> like I've dropped off the face of the earth and I said, don't oh, shoot. Yeah, every day and so on and so forth. And uh, he said, well, I had a fr I've got a friend and he's wanting to start up a new press and he's looking for manuscripts. Would you like to send him one? So I did. And while he died, Cold War came out. Um, so, yeah, it's it's um, if, if you want to get published. Uh, yeah. know people find people to know. Um, share your work with people uh and and have them share the share your work with you because you're going to broaden your your uh you'll broaden your field you'll broaden your your scope of of what you want uh the more fo forms and poems you're exposed to and poets uh it, it, they, it shapes your work it makes your work better um and so that's that's i guess all i have to say with that all right. Well, uh, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate Crystal and Worthy. You guys were wonderful. I love how all three of you uh, sort of plumb that history, that Southern history in your work. And I really uh, thank you so much for participating. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so thank you for attending Poetry Goes Viral. This is a reading hosted by the Carolina Poets Facebook page. If you came in late, don't worry. All of our readings are archived. We host readings on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. We feature both established poets and emerging voices. I'm gonna drop links to the three poets that read tonight in the chat and please support their work. Uh, check out the links to their work and please support uh, art that moves you. Thank you very much for joining us. Good night.